All right. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here and um, to share some uh, of the research that I've been working on lately with you. I'm uh, looking forward to your feedback and hopefully contributing to the process of um, exposing you to different, lots of different kinds of research um, at the ICPSR uh, summer, summer program. So, all right. Hope everything looks good now. Um, so I want to acknowledge these co-authors who've um, who I've worked with on on these research projects. And as I was saying, um, what I'll be sharing with you are the results of a research that I've been doing on uh, three closely related uh, claims about um, the role of uh, misinformation in our politics, both how people are exposed to it and what um, and how we might counter it. Um, this is obviously most salient in the context, of, and I'll share those claims with you in one in one minute. Um, these claims are, are most salient in, in our current environment in the context of COVID-19. That's uh, a context where people are very worried about the role of misinformation and how people are being exposed to it, as well as what, how we, what we might do to counter it. These are some data from very early in the pandemic illustrating um, the, you know, at least among the public, um, they think they see a lot of misinformation and many of them do report um, believing in um, some of the unsupported claims that were out there. Now, as we can talk about, of course, the, the, the so-called lab leak hypothesis is now uh, a matter of uh, debate, um, but there's certainly uh, you know, very little evidence for the um, developed intentionally claimed despite all the controversy over that issue. Um, so what, what we want to do in these research projects was, was examine these three closely related claims, which come up over and over again in the context of specific controversies over matters of fact, um, as like what we've seen during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the first claim is about the information diets of Americans. Um, specifically, the claim is that people are in uh, so-called echo chambers of like-minded information. Um, when they consume information online, they're disproportionately being fed information that seems to confirm their predispositions. And in this way, um, that process of differential information exposure is contributing to polarization, um, contributing to misperceptions, contributing to extremism. Um, the second claim um, is the claim that in particular, people are consuming lots and lots of so-called fake news or extreme content from um, platforms like YouTube. Um, and then the final claim is um, it's very difficult to uh, counter uh, these sorts of claims because when we uh, try to, by exposing people to corrective information in the form of, of for instance, fact checks, um, those will actually backfire. And you see some mix of um, these uh, claims often in combination to support the sorts of sweeping generalizations we'll hear that we're in a post-truth society, um, that we're in a so-called infodemic, that people are being um, that truth doesn't matter anymore and things like that. And I don't want to minimize any of these concerns. They're very serious. Okay? But the empirical claims that are being made are ones we should be evaluating using the tools of social science. Um, and I will submit to you that in their more extreme versions of the sort that I've highlighted here, um, these are myths. Um, and I'll be specific about uh, what I mean by that. Um, so what I'll share with you is research showing uh, first, that um, the online echo chamber claim uh, is uh, greatly overstated. It's actually quite rare for Americans uh, to have um, highly slanted information diets in general. Um, uh, it's really a small subset of the population that consumes a lot of pro-attitudinal information. Um, second, in particular, when we dig down on these particular areas of concern, um, so-called fake news, and extremist content on YouTube, we find a very similar pattern. We find that the average person is consuming none of this information or very little, and it's really only small minorities of the population that are consuming this in appreciable volumes. Um, however, those folks who are consuming this information are in some cases consuming quite a lot of it. Um, so if you put these two sets of findings together, it really changes um, our understanding, I will argue, of the nature of the problem. It's not that the average person is in an echo chamber or the average person is consuming a lot of fake news or extremist content from YouTube. 
It's really that there's a small, highly vocal, highly visible minority of people who are doing so. Um, and um, they're providing an audience for elites, for content entrepreneurs um, uh, that, you know, is, is big enough to induce more of this kind of, of content and to make it visible in our public life, even when they really represent a very small percentage of the public. Um, and then finally, what I'll do is I'll talk about my research on what we can do about the misinformation that is out there and is very much a problem. Um, and what I'll show is that the research has been done since some of the very first work in this field by my uh, co-author Jason Reifler and myself. Um, what we find and what others have found as research has gone on in this field is that corrections are usually uh, effective at increasing the accuracy of people's beliefs. When you expose people to corrective information, um, their perceptions of the accuracy of the claims in question tend to go down. So in other words, we're reducing the misperceptions in question. However, what we're showing in new research that I'll share with you and what others have, I think are, are increasingly finding as well is that these effects do not persist. Um, it's very difficult to induce lasting changes in misperceptions. And again, this changes our, our, uh, you know, our understanding of the problem. It's not that we can't get people to accept fact checks. It's instead that we can't induce lasting change in their factual beliefs, even for fact checks that they um, that do have the intended effect on their beliefs at the moment of exposure. Okay, um, so the, the two theoretical frameworks that are relevant here um, are uh, huge literatures on two related but distinct topics. The first is what's often called selective exposure. Um, and this is the idea that people um, have a, tend to have a preference for congenial information, information that's consistent with their predispositions, um, group identity, um, you know, whatever might lead them to have some kind of a, uh, a preference for one type of information versus uh, another, um, these preferences that they might have may cause them to selectively consume that information which is congenial to them, and at least to some extent, avoid information that's counterattitudinal. It's hotly debated the extent to which that um, those preferences are symmetric, um, but at least that preference for pro-attitudinal information is something that's been shown um, in a lot of prior research. Um, what I want to push harder on is the notion that when you ask people, which of these would you like to prefer, would you like to consume? And they tell you the pro-attitudinal information. Um, I wanna push on the notion that that means that in practice, they will be making those choices at scale over and over again in the course of their life with everything else that's going on and all the other influences on their information diet. Um, what um, my uh, co-authors and I show in a, in a literature review we did looking across this entire literature is it's really only a subset of people who have these strong selective exposure preferences who are really making an effort to consume heavily pro attitudinal information um, particularly from like-minded outlets. Um, and it's many, many other people have relatively balanced information diets, or it turns out, pay very little attention to politics at all. Um, the second theoretical framework that's relevant here is directionally motivated reasoning. Um, again, it's been well established in many prior studies that um, people have a tendency to believe information that's congenial with some directional preference they might have, such as their preferred party, their preferred ideology, a group they identify with and so forth. Um, again, however, the question is how strong that motivation is in practice. Um, some research, including some of my own research, suggested that those directional preferences could overwhelm the accuracy motivations they might have, but um, more recent research suggests that exposure to information like fact checks um, can um, successfully cause people to update their beliefs. It doesn't appear that directionally motivated reasoning is um, preventing people from updating their beliefs accurately, at least in the kinds of circumstances in which we're often uh, uh, exposing them to fact checks. Um, so when we're trying to answer these questions, so what we're interested in is to what extent do people engage in selective exposure or engage in directly motivated reasoning um, under realistic uh, conditions. Um, and prior research has relied very heavily on surveys. Um, so if you think, I mean, of course, this is ICPSR, right? So surveys are the, the coin of the realm. Um, a great deal of social science is built on survey research. Um, and that research provides us with very high quality measures 
of people's attitudes and reported factual beliefs. But what they what surveys are less good at capturing is the way people actually behave in the real world with all the other competing influences on their attention um, and all the other thing uh, factors that may influence the choice, the choices they make of what information they consume. Um, there's been a more recent research, so maybe in the last 10 to 15 years, um, that uses what's often called digital trace data to measure the information people are exposed to. Um, and that's proven to be quite valuable in understanding how people behave out of the survey context, what information consumption choices um, they actually make, um, how information actually spreads in the real world. But uh, that type of research has often um, lacked corresponding measures of people's attitudes and preferences that's really important for understanding who these people are that are making these information consumption choices. Um, and so what I'll be sharing with you is, um, uh, are, is results from a series of studies um, by my co-author Andy Guess, um, and then a series of collaborations between Guess, uh, myself, and other co-authors, especially Jason Reifler, um, where we combine survey, re survey measures of people's attitudes and preferences with digital trace data that allows us to observe their actual information consumption behavior. Um, all right, so the first myth that we'll be talking about is this claim that uh, most Americans are in uh, online echo chambers. Um, this is a claim that's, um, you know, I think almost, it's, it's hard to avoid this claim. It's been in circulation in some form, dating at least back to Cass Sunstein's book, republic.com, which uh, came out in kind of early days of the internet when there were a lot of idealized notions about how the internet would expose people to truth. And Sunstein said, no, actually, we're going to get this highly personalized information stream that's going to cater to our preferences in perverse ways. And as time has gone on, in and in particular, as social media has risen, there has been a, um, a, a growth in people invoking this claim that, that people are in echo chambers online. And that's contributing to the polarization that we, we see in the real world. Um, you see this again and again. Um, in media coverage of issues related to polarization, of issues related to misinformation and online discourse, as in it, the examples here. Um, but these kinds of general, sweeping generalizations and anecdotes that people offer don't really test these notions empirically. Um, so uh, my co-author, Andy Guess, um, has a very important paper that's now in the American Journal of Political Science that interrogates these claims. And importantly, interrogates these claims using that powerful combination of survey data paired with digital trace data. So the, um, uh, the, the survey data comes from a panel um, at the company, the survey company YouGov, um, the special pulse panel they have where these are, these are there's an opt-in internet sample that's um, matched and weighted to approximate the US uh, population, and it's a special panel um, of people who've also agreed to provide um, anonymized uh, information on their web browsing behavior um, uh, as part of their participation in the survey panel. Um, so um, on the margin, you, you should think of this as, you know, trading off some degree of representativeness for uh, this, this very rich digital behavioral data. So the, um, the approximation of a probability sample is um, a bit more imperfect than your average YouGov sample, um, but it's the sample is quite diverse, hits a lot of uh, benchmarks uh, for a survey and has this rich behavioral data. I'm happy to talk about that more in Q&A. Um, what Andy's graphing here that's that allows us to adjudicate the claim in question um, is uh, media uh, information uh, consumption data that he takes from um, the digital trace data that's been collected as part of their participation in the YouGov Pulse panel. People visit websites. Those websites are um, uh, made available to the researcher in the form of a list with a time and a URL. Um, Andy is simply mapping those URLs to the estimated slant of a large number of websites um, produced by data scientists at Facebook using the uh, information sharing behaviors of Facebook users. So they scale websites from the most liberal to the most conservative by uh, how often they're shared by self-identified liberals versus conservatives on Facebook. So people who in their profile say they're liberal or conservative. So here, a negative one would indicate a site that is exclusively shared by self-identified liberals, never shared by self-identified conservatives. 
Conversely, a one on the right would be a site that is exclusively shared by self-identified conservatives, never by self-identified liberals. Okay, so if you look in the left panel first, what you'll see is that um, independents, self-identified independents, Republicans, and Democrats um, all have um, reasonably unimodal distributions centered near um, the middle of this media slant distribution. So this is the average slant of the average website um, uh, that uh, each of these people visits. Um, and uh, what this, these data are indicating, although you can see that there's, you know, there's uh, the distribution of Republicans with average media diets uh, on the conservative side of things is, is a little bit greater. And conversely, uh, for Democrats, there's a, a, a kind of a hump on the left shoulder of that distribution, if you will, um, indicating that there's some Democrats who have media diets with a more liberal slant on average, you can see they're actually far more centrist than the media discourse would lead you to assume. So the average Democrats, Republican, and the average Democrat, the average Republican, and the average independent has a more balanced or centrist information diet than the conventional discourse would assume. So why does it seem so different? Okay, so that's where I wanna direct you to the panel on the right, which shows instead of um, the average slant of the average respondents media diet, it looks at the overall distribution of websites viewed by Democrats and Republicans. And there you can see the stark divergence between Democrats and Republicans, where um, there's a, a lot of Democratic traffic to heavily liberal sites on the left side of the uh, figure. Um, and there's a huge um, uh, hump on the right side of the figure among Republicans that has no counterpart among Democrats, right? Corresponding to the Fox News and Breitbart type websites um, that Republicans differentially consume. Um, so why are these so different? Well, it turns out there's a relatively small subset of people who consume a lot of political news. And the people who consume the most political news um, are uh, have highly polarized information diets. And they are driving this highly, and as a result, of their differential consumption of political news, we have this highly polarized traffic distribution on the right, even though the average person's traffic uh, data is far less polarized as the panel on the left suggests. Um, so um, there's evidence of, of this in other areas too, that the, the tendency towards selective exposure is overstated. Um, in later research, we looked at um, uh, exposure to uh, websites uh, related to vaccines um, between 2016 and 2019. Um, we uh, scraped the text of um, the websites uh, that our uh, panelists visited and then looked for ones that mentioned vaccines more than once. And an RA actually uh, coded these for whether they were skeptical about the safety and efficacy of vaccines or not. And again, what we were looking for was evidence of selective exposure to vaccine uh, related information based on people's attitudes about vaccines. So this is an area, again, where people worry about selective exposure, but it's not quite the same set of attitudes as a standard party, um, uh, the kind of uh, partisanship distribution that we normally focus on. Um, and what you can see here are the, the key results of our, our study. Um, rates of exposure to vaccine related information are, are uh, quite low. Um, you know, most people visit at least one, we estimate from our data, about 84% uh, of people visit at least one vaccine related web page per year. But exposure rates to any uh, web page that's skeptical about the safety and efficacy of vaccines, much lower. The annualized rate is 18%. Uh, percent, and the traffic uh, to those pages is even lower. So you see only um, fewer than one in 10 of the web pages that people go to, 7.5% of the vaccine related web page views that people have are to these to these uh, skeptical web pages. Um, in particular, um, when we disaggregated people by, based on their attitudes towards vaccines as measured in surveys, um, what you can see is the people who um, had, even the people who had the least favorable attitudes towards vaccines, in other words, they were in the bottom tercile of the vaccine attitude distribution, um, were consuming more um, uh, information from web pages that were not skeptical about the safety and efficacy of vaccines compared to those that were. Um, you can see that there is an upward trend such that the people who have the most favorable views of vaccines um, are more likely on the left to have visited at least one 
uh, web page that was not skeptical about the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Um, and similarly, in terms of mean exposure in the right panel, but there's no, no evidence that these people who are who have less favorable or more unfavorable attitudes towards vaccines are consuming lots of anti-vaccine uh, information. Um, you can see, as you can see in the with the left pair of bars in both the left panel and the right panel, um, even that group is uh, has a diet that is slanted towards um, pro-vaccine information. Okay, so the second um, myth I'll be talking about is uh, the claim, which is related to this echo chamber's claim, but it gets more specific, uh, that uh, fake news consumption and consumption of extremist content on YouTube and so forth is common. Um, so I'll start with fake news. Um, this was a, there was a kind of panic after the 2016 election, as people became aware of the extent to which stories like this were shared on Facebook in the period before the 2016 election. Uh, stories like this on, were shared on Facebook millions of times. These are the most, the five most widely shared um, so-called fake news stories um, in the, from, the, uh, uh, from people who, whose sharing permissions on Facebook um, made their sharing public, uh, according to journalism published by Craig Silverman. Um, so uh, these stories were widely shared and there was a kind of panic that um, these stories were uh, you know, the majority. Of, you know, there were claims made, that sweeping claims about the extent of exposure to these kinds of articles and um, various uh, extrapolations from there about their potential influence on, for instance, vote choice, um, you know, with the suggestion that Donald Trump might have won because of this kind of uh, uh, false news coverage. So uh, Andy and Jason and I wanted to actually examine empirically whether how much people were viewing websites like this. Um, was it actually the case that people were consuming a lot of this information? Who were the people who were um, consuming news from websites like the ones on the, uh, that I just showed you, these dubious and untrustworthy sources online. Um, so using the same kind of YouGov pulse data, um, so uh, online sample matched and weighted to approximate nationally representative sample with uh, paired behavioral data um, that has timestamped URL uh, exposures, um, we looked at um, how often uh, people in the approximately six weeks up to and just after the 2016 election visited one of a huge set of sites that had been identified as untrustworthy in prior research. So these were websites that in this Grinberg et al. science article had been identified as, as using uh, either known um, pr uh, proprietors of uh, known producers of misinformation or sites that used editorial processes that were unreliable. And what we find is uh, fewer than half of all uh, Americans, we estimate, um, saw at least one article from one of these websites in the period before the fall 2016 election. Now, it's important to be clear that the, the YouGov Pulse data um, is uh, desktop and laptop based. It's an important caveat to all the results I'll suggest with you. We're not able to see what people saw on social media. I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. So the kind of momentary exposures one might have on social media, we're not able to observe. Um, but what we can say is the kind of more the, the uh, more sustained engagement that might come if people actually click a link and load um, a web page and read it, um, we can estimate the frequency of that at least on desktop and laptop. And what we find is again, fewer than half of Americans um, visiting at least one of these untrustworthy websites. You can see the mean is 14 articles. Um, uh, but that's really, that's really uh, skewed by some people who consumed a tremendous amount of this information. Um, so uh, what we have uh, in uh, the graphs that are presented there are first uh, the proportion of people who went to at least one of these untrustworthy websites. And then on the right, the share of their information diet um, about hard news topics that these sites made up. And because we're interested in selective exposure, we disaggregate people by whether they supported Clinton or Trump in the election. Um, and we disaggregate the untrustworthy websites by whether they were could be classified as pro-Clinton or pro-Trump. And what you'll see is evidence that's first consistent with the, the selective exposure theory. If you look on the left, 
you will see that Clinton supporters were relatively more likely to have visited a pro-Clinton, untrustworthy news website than Trump supporters. Conversely, Trump supporters were much more likely to have visited a pro-Trump, untrustworthy site than Clinton supporters. Um, however, when you look at the right panel, you'll see that um, as a share of people's information diets, the, uh, the proportion of, of information on hard news topics that came from these untrustworthy websites was negligible for pro-Clinton sites and for pro-Trump sites among Clinton, uh, sorry, for pro-Clinton sites and for pro-Trump sites among Clinton supporters. The only group where um, this exposure level was non-trivial was pro-Trump sites for pro-Trump supporters. But you can see even there on average, um, uh, you know, we're in the 10 to 15 uh, percent range in terms of the share of people's information diet uh, from uh, of coming from websites that focus on hard news topics. Now, I've told you that selective exposure is uh, something that really uh, varies across the population in a granular way. So what we're going to do here is disaggregate the uh, information diets of our panelists um, on the uh, liberal to conservative spectrum using the same approach that uh, Andy Guest used in the prior research I shared with you. So um, taking the estimated slant of all the websites people visit, averaging it over all the, uh, based on all the page views that they, um, uh, that they generate um, and classifying people into deciles from the most liberal decile, which is at number one there on the left indicating that 10% of Americans with the most liberal information diets to the 10% of Americans on the right and the, the indicated as 10, the 10% 10 of Americans with the most conservative information diets. And what you can see here is when we disaggregate the data in this way, you can see those same selective exposure tendencies in a more granular form. So you can see as you move to the left, exposure to pro-Clinton uh, on trustworthy websites increases. Um, and then especially as you move to the right, exposure to pro-Trump uh, uh, untrustworthy websites increases, particularly in the ninth and 10th decile. You'll see those stand out in the left in terms of the proportion of people in those deciles who went to an, a pro-Trump untrustworthy website at least once. Now, if you turn your attention to the panel on the right, you'll see even more starkly how different the information consumption behaviors are. The 20% um, of Americans with the most conservative information diets, indicated with the nine and the 10 there, um, you can see that pro-Trump untrustworthy websites made up a substantial uh, fraction of the information they consume from websites focusing on hard news topics, um, close to 25% in both cases. Um, you can see that they're uh, a non-trivial proportion of the information uh, people got in the eighth decile also has that property. And for everyone else, it's virtually zero. So the consumption, um, one way to summarize the information in the right panel is to think about how much exposure on trustworthy websites comes from uh, those 20% of people with the most conservative information diets. And what we find is more than half, I think it's about six in 10 uh, page views for those untrustworthy websites uh, came from the 20% of Americans with the most conservative information diets. So again, this, story, this broad story about echo chambers is really uh, about a smaller set of people um, with these intense specific uh, preferences for selective exposure. When we uh, ask how people got to this content, uh, the data suggests that Facebook did play a key role in the way that media coverage suggests. You'll see there on the left that um, Facebook stands out. When we looked at the websites, um, people visited immediately prior to visiting a, uh, a given news site um, relative to so-called hard news websites, untrustworthy news websites differentially uh, had Facebook appearing in the set of URLs people visited immediately prior to entering those sites, suggesting it was helping to funnel people towards them. Um, there's a very uh, uh, similar pattern of, the, of highly skewed information consumption that uh, Grinberg et al. find in their study of um, exposure to uh, so-called fake news on Twitter. Um, you can see uh, in their graph there um, that what they're, what they're plotting is the proportion of um, uh, fake news sources according to their classification system um, 
as a as a share of people's total exposure to uh, political information. And the so-called super consumers in their data um, are dominating exposure to this type of content. You can see at the very bottom there, the top 1% of people in their sample in terms of their exposure to fake news sources are responsible for 74% of the exposures to this kind of content. So again, very small percentages of the public making up a lot of the actual consumption behavior for this particular kind of content of concern. Okay, so um, there's a very similar story, it turns out, when it comes to um, questionable information on YouTube. There's been another kind of panic about uh, you know, as we move from Facebook to YouTube is the source of panic about technology and social media. There's been a fear that um, YouTube's algorithm is radicalizing people, um, driving them, uh, you know, funneling them down so-called rabbit holes. Um, and this concern has prompted YouTube to alter, uh, to alter their algorithm um, in important ways. But uh, the fear uh, continues that YouTube is um, promoting exposure to this kind of content and that it's common. Um, and Again, this is a question, this is an empirical question that we can examine with data. Um, so my, my co-authors and I um, examined exposure to, in this case, we didn't. We had to build our own set of data. So we're looking at exposure to videos from channels that have identified as so-called uh, alternative channels that are often gateways to uh, questionable content um, or explicitly extremist or white supremacist channels. And these are, these are uh, lists of channels that have been compiled either by subject matter experts or by scholars. Um, and here, what we're, the, the data come from a set of uh, YouGov panelists, but instead of uh, providing data via the YouGov Pulse panel, they've actually opted into a browser extension um, at, that's allowed us to examine their YouTube browsing behavior and their browsing history on YouTube. Um, when we look at the results, we'll see we see um, relatively small minorities of people um, viewing videos from these alternative and extremist channels. You can see on the left, fewer um, than twenty five percent of participants visited at least one of these alternative channels. Um, fewer than one in ten visit one of the, one of these extremist channels, um, and uh, mean levels of exposure are quite low as well. Um, so this is really something, again, that's being driven by a relatively small uh, number of people. Um, one way to show that is just to um, think about, uh, again, how many people are responsible for the bulk of this uh, exposure. And so here you can see that 11% of users were responsible for 80% of the alternative videos people watch. You can see the corresponding uh, number for extremist videos is even lower. So it's, it's substantially lower than 11%, something like just eyeballing it, maybe six, 7% of all users were responsible for 80% of the extremist videos that people watch. So again, the story is very similar. Small minorities of people responsible for the bulk of the questionable information consumption. Who are these people? Well, we were able to survey participants who had previously taken part in a survey that uh, administered a standard measure of racial resentment. And when we did that, what we see is that especially when it comes to mean videos watched, which is in the right panel, people who scored high uh, in the top tercile of racial resentment using that standard measure um, uh, consumed substantially more videos from alternative or extremist channels. Virtually all of the extremist uh, video channel consumption in particular came from people in that top tercile of racial resentment. So in other words, it's not the average person who is consuming, encountering this content via the so-called rabbit holes hypothesis, but instead people who are high in racial resentment, who as the prior, as the data I'm about to show you will suggest, don't seem to be getting recommended that content as much as seeking it out. Um, and the, the basis for that statement is that we actually were able to capture the recommendations that were being offered to people. Um, and what we find is that when people are watching videos of any other type, besides these alternative channels and extremist channels we've identified, the recommendations that they're offered overwhelmingly are not to these alternative or extremist channels. You can see in the top 98% um, of um, recommendations 
that people receive are when they're watching these other kinds of content. And um, the among those, the, the fraction that of recommendations that direct people to videos from alternative or extremist channels is vanishingly small. Um, however, when it comes to uh, people who are already watching alternative or extremist channels, then the recommendations are more likely to direct people to potentially harmful content. And you can see in particular in the top center, in the center panel in the top row, um, that when people are watching alternative channels are often recommended other videos from alternative channels. And um, about you know, less than half of the recommendations are to alternative or extremist channels, but um, a substantial minority. Um, and you can see in the top right that when people are watching extremist uh, content, um, that they're a minority of recommendations, but a non-trivial one, uh, direct them to other videos from extremist channels. So um, it doesn't appear to be the case, in other words, that people are being recommended this content when they're watching um, innocuous videos of other types. But when they happen to, when they, by whatever means, reach this content, they are being recommended more of it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, if these are people who already have high levels of, for instance, racial resentment that this content appeals to, you can imagine how they might come to watch more of it. Um, Finally, the third myth that I'll talk about, and then I want, I'd really be interested in your questions, um, is that fact checks backfire. So when people are exposed to misinformation via the kinds of means that we've been talking about, that fact checks may not be effective. Um, and here, um, my own research um, played a key role in this discussion because the first study that um, Rifler and I published on fact checking found that in two of the five experiments we conducted, as in this case here, when we randomly expose people to corrective information in a mock news story um, about a controversial issue, um, the group that was sympathetic to the misperception uh, in question expressed more belief in the statement rather than less uh, when it was corrected. Um, the backfire effect received a great deal of media coverage. And in the process, um, people extrapolated that uh, fact checks always backfire. Um, which was not a claim we made and is certainly not something that subsequent research has borne out. Um, so um, an example here from uh, research I've conducted with Rifler and Ethan Porter at GW and Tom Wood at OSU, um, looking at uh, fact-checking Donald Trump's convention speech in 2016, which warned of um, rising crime. Um, and we tested a fact-check, which explained to people that actually crime was down over the prior 10 years, quite substantially. Um, and what we find is that that fact check decreased people's misperceptions about crime. And so that's that's indicated here by moving to the left, higher values on this on the x-axis indicate greater misperceptions. Um, and importantly, we saw that movement both among Trump voters and among Clinton voters. So even Trump voters who might be predisposed to believe claims that Trump made were uh, less likely to express them um, after being exposed to this fact check. And those effects held even when the uh, uh, Trump campaign or Trump himself were, were challenging the fact check in some way. So it does appear to be the case that when you fact check information in general, um, the effect is to reduce the perceived accuracy of the claim that you've debunked. Um, and that's an encouraging finding. And that's one that holds up in recent meta analyses. Uh, it's not an artifact of any particular study. However, there is this question, if that's the case, then why uh, are misperceptions seemingly so common? So my co-authors and I uh, did um, a series of uh, experiments um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, testing the effects of fact-checking myths about COVID-19 uh, in three countries, the US, the UK, and Canada. The US and UK studies are multi-wave, which allows us to examine persistence in the effects we observe over time. Okay, so we're able to see what happens if you fact check information, not just at the time that you expose people to that corrective information, but afterwards, um, uh, when we return to you later and ask you what you believe, does that fact check leave a lasting impression or not? Um, we, uh, people were asked in these surveys about three types of claims. Um, the false beliefs that people in the treatment condition were shown fact checks of, um, uh, such as the claim that the coronavirus was a bioweapon, 
Um, other false beliefs that were not targeted with fact checks, such as the claim that eating garlic prevents infection. Um, and then true claims about COVID-19, such as loss of taste or smell being one of the symptoms that people might experience. Um, and exposure to uh, these fact checks was randomized by WAVE in the US and UK designs in uh, either WAVE 2, people could receive the treatment in WAVE 2, WAVE 3, both or neither. Um, Canada was two one-wave surveys, and so there's simply a treatment and control condition. The control group didn't receive any fact check. Um, and uh, what you can see here are plots of um, uh, the effect of the treatment by country by wave. Okay, so I'll talk you through these um, panel by panel, starting on the left. Um, so um, what you can see is um, in the pre-treatment wave, wave one in the US and UK, consistent with randomization being successful, there's no difference in uh, mean beliefs in the fact checks that were, uh, sorry, in the beliefs that were targeted by the fact checks. Um, but when you get to wave two, because this panel represents the group that was randomly assigned to get a fact check um, uh, in that wave, um, belief in uh, the claims that have been debunked uh, decreases. So you can see uh, by almost a quarter point on the four point accuracy outcome scale uh, that we tested. Um, and that effect is observed uh, across countries and samples. But what you can see is then as you move forward to subsequent waves, we observe uh, a subsequent, uh, an additional wave in the US and uh, UK. Um, and then we observe yet another wave in the US, um, uh, the fourth wave, which is only in the US those beliefs have rebounded back to being, being no longer statistically distinguishable from the control group. Um, if you look at uh, the middle panel and the right panel, you'll actually see the same story playing out. Um, the uh, middle panel represents the group that was randomly assigned to re receive a fact check in wave three only. And you can see um, their beliefs and the claims that have been fact checked decrease in that wave, rebound, um, back actually to the other side of the control group by the final wave. Um, and then lastly, on the right, even the group that receives the fact checks twice, you might say that repetition might help these beliefs stick. But in fact, when we observe those folks who got both uh, fact checks in wave two in the US sample and fact checks in wave three, by wave four, their beliefs have rebounded and are statistically no different than the control group. Um, so to summarize, um, I want to, I want to share what I think these findings imply. I think we've misunderstood the challenge and the problem, and that's, um, distorted our understanding of the solutions we might pursue. Um, as I hope I've convinced you, it's really a small proportion of people who are consuming information in a manner that we might find problematic, whether it's highly slanted information diets or exposure to false or extremist content, right? That is not um, largely a mainstream phenomenon. It's really these small uh, uh, subsets uh, of the public. And um, I think that that cha might change our notion of um, what it might have uh, on our politics, for instance, right? Um, the idea that uh, Donald Trump won in 2016 based on exposure to untrustworthy websites, for instance, is inconsistent with that data I showed you earlier, because it was only the very hardcore folks who are consuming that information in any appreciable number. Um, so it's very important to understand um, the audiences for these kinds of content um, and to think about um, the harms that uh, exposing them to so much of this potentially harmful or slanted content uh, might have. And again, I think that's a different way of thinking about the problem than the notion that um, the median voter is diluted in consuming this kind of information at, at, at great volume. And then finally, um, I think we've misunderstood the nature of the problem of correcting the misperceptions that the kind of false information I was talking about earlier can produce. Um, fact checks do seem to be effective at reducing the accuracy of people's beliefs when they first encounter them. Um, but even once repeated, they don't seem to be producing the kinds of lasting changes in people's beliefs that we would need if we were trying to um, reduce these misperceptions in the long term. So there's a lot uh, still uh, left 
to learn here and uh, I'm eager to hear your questions. So I will go ahead and turn off my shared screen so I can see you all and you can see me and um, look forward to whatever questions you have. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Brendan, for a very interesting oh. presentation. And I can uh, moderate the discussion if you like. Um, we have a couple of questions already. Uh, if uh, members of the audience can send questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and the first questions are really, uh, si si since you uh, presented such a data rich uh, assembly of information about the methodology. So one question is, how does the pulse panel behavioral data handle expectation or experimenter effects? I guess we could call these demand characteristics of a kind. I would assume people might alter their browsing Mike. behavior if they knew their online activity was being observed. I'm getting very loud interference, Michael. It might be because you have two devices connected. All right, let me do that. Is that better? Um, shall I repeat the question, Brendan? Oh, I could hear it. I, I was guessing that that interference was from inter, uh, was from your two devices both being unmuted. So if you mute yeah. one, that might help. Um, yeah. Not the video, the audio. Um, so uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the question about experimenter or demand effects. Um, this is an important one, um, and it's something we've worried about a lot. Certainly, something we've been asked a lot. Um, so it's a really good question, Sarah. Um, what I would say is um, that the uh, the pulse panel seems to essentially disappear to our participants. Um, uh, anecdotally, people seem to kind of not pay very close attention to it on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe once they install it, um, it's salient, but over time, it's just something installed on their computer. They don't seem to be thinking uh, much about. Um, and I will tell you without going into great detail that the kinds of websites that they visit um, uh, suggest that they are not uh, especially um, uh, concerned with uh, demand effects. Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of uh, leave it at that. Um, one other um, uh, uh, point that might be uh, helpful to you is, um, well, actually two, two other points that I'll, I'll note. First is we've looked at the correspondence between the behavior we observe and other sources of behavioral data, like um, the COM score uh, uh, consumption data. And we see a good correspondence suggesting that we're picking up the same kinds of behavior uh, as other sources. Um, the other point uh, that I'll add is that when we um, survey people who use the Pulse panel, you might, there, you might worry about uh, the, co the corresponding uh, fear, which is um, these people are a little too unconcerned about their privacy. Um, we surveyed uh, members of the Pulse panel, and we found that in general, their attitudes towards online privacy were, the distributions were quite similar to um, the public as a whole for three of the four questions we asked. And the results are in the appendix of the, um, the article about those untrustworthy websites that I was sharing. Um, so it seems like um, people are not obviously self-censoring, on data on, on visit websites that might be more sensitive than, you know, generic political untrustworthy sites of the sort that we've been talking about. Um, and on the other hand, they don't seem to have uh, freakishly weird privacy attitudes either. Um, we can't rule this out though. And that's why one of the reasons why it's so important to get lots of different kinds of digital behavioral data and not get too over invested in the particular behavior of the YouGov Pulse panel, which a lot of this data I've been sharing with you is from, uh, but you know we're going to do best in this area if we triangulate using a lot of different sources. Another question is whether you asked the same set of questions in each wave. I'm not sure which of the studies that refers to, but um, I mean I'm going to guess it's the COVID study because that was the multi-wave one. And yes, we did, we did. That's right. So when I was showing you. Um, so actually the, the results over uh, multiple waves, um, we were, what we were comparing there were an the answers to uh, 
when people were asked to rate the accuracy of the same set of factual claims in each wave, and we compared the uh, perceived accuracy of the claims targeted in the fact checks between the treatment and control group, um, and it's the same set in each wave. So it's repeated up to four times depending on uh, the country. Um, one additional set of findings I'll note, I don't know if that sound is me or someone else. Um, one, uh, one additional finding I'll note is that um, we didn't find um, consistent evidence of spillovers of fact check exposure to people's other beliefs, um, their beliefs in the true or false claims that were not the subject of the fact check, with one exception. Um, if you recall, one of the fact checks was about the bioweapon claim. Um, we had a, a kind of lab leak claim, which at the time we designed the study was thought of as uh, a misperception and now has come you know, into question. Um, we do observe exposure to the fact check debunking the bioweapon claim, driving down belief in the associated lab leak claim. When you uh, set up your presentation, Brendan, you talked about uh, information exposure and consumption patterns uh, by, by framing it uh, as relevant possibly to selective exposure and to motivated reasoning as possible explanations. You didn't say anything about this at the end. What is your belief now based upon your work about, about selective exposure and motivated reasoning? Oh, that's a great question. Yes. Um, so the way I think about it is that um, the kinds of stylized um, survey measures and experiments we've done in the past um, don't adequately capture the extent to which um, those factors operate in the real world. So let me start with selective exposure. Um, the conclusion I have is that selective exposure is far more heterogeneous than survey measures really allow us to observe. And let me give you an example of that. We might do a poll and we might say to people, what's your preferred or most trusted source of news? And we might get 30 to 40% of Americans say who would uh, indicate Fox News. But what our data suggests is that among that group, there are people who, yes, if you told them turn on a news channel would select Fox, but almost never pay attention to politics. And there, there are also people in that group who would be consuming Fox and Fox-like information in vast quantities. And those, their, their levels of consumption of that kind of pro-attitudinal information are just orders of magnitude different. And so selective exposure really isn't capturing uh, that heterogeneity. And actually there's a third group in there that I should mention, people who watch Fox, but also read enough stuff that's left of center that their overall information diet looks um, more balanced than you might think from them indicating that Fox is their most preferred uh, source of news. So um, I, I'm having done this research has transformed my view of those me those self reports of media consumption. I think um, they had their they have their value, um, but at this point. I'm quite distrustful of them just because it is so hard for any of us to, Michael, do you mind muting in case that's you? Um, Not adequate, me. It's... Thanks. Um, it's hard for any of us to adequately self-report um, on uh, the media sources that we use. Um, you know, just think about if I asked you, where did you get your news in the last week, right? How difficult that might be, how many different kinds of information you were exposed to. Um, and the biggest challenge in this area going forward is going to be looking at that question on mobile and across platforms. Um, right now, uh, we have a desktop laptop centric view of the world, and we have a tough time with um, uh, platform and mobile data. So those are going to be important challenges. Um, on directionally motivated reasoning, um, yeah, my, I, I've, I've very much updated my views. Um, I think directionally motivated reasoning can be expressed in different ways and in some cases may not be as strong as we thought. So um, what these recent studies have shown them is that most people will not 
double down that uh, accuracy improvements really can come from fact check exposure, even about very controversial issues. Um, however, it may be the case that people won't update their views um, when it comes to pol measures of policy or attitudes towards the candidate uh, or political figure in question in the way you would expect. And that might be where people's directional preferences uh, would come in. I'm going to interject the question here before returning to the audience questions, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, I've been doing motivated reasoning research for a while and continue, but and continue to do that, but looking at a completely different dependent variable, which is assessments of accuracy. Um, so we show people in survey based experiments, a poll result and ask them whether they think it's accurate or not. And we observe very strong effects based upon partisanship, if it's about, say, two candidates or in policy polls, depending upon their own position on an issue. It's not exactly the same as obviously the studies that you've been uh, conducting about media consumption and its impact. Um, is, it, is there a way that you can think uh, about squaring those results, allowing for the difference in the measurement of the dependent variable? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I, I appreciate that. And, and let me, let me tell you where I think some of the research in my area has gone that I think relates to the, the, the kind of outcome measure you're describing. So um, this is not my area, but I'm familiar with this, 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 this line of research. Or, you know, when you ask people how accurate is this poll, their partisanship and the outcome of the poll conditions at least what they self-report to you in, in terms of their perception of the validity of the, uh, the, how well the poll was conducted. Um, so I would make a distinction between that and responding to corrective information. So you're really, it's not just, just top of the head, how do you think, how good do you think this is, but it's instead a relatively definitive, relatively conclusive information, informational message. Um, now, it is the case that when you give people these fact checks, they don't like it. <laughs> so that part actually feels a lot like the way they um, react to those polls. So when we gave people that fact check, that I described to you about perceptions of crime. Um, and even though people's beliefs became more accurate, the people who got the fact check and for whom it was counter attitudinal rated it as more biased and less trustworthy. <laughs> Nonetheless, they updated their beliefs in the direction we would hope based on the information provided in the fact check. So there does seem to be a kind of instinctual reaction um, uh, when it comes to uh, counter attitudinal information that's expressed towards kind of the validity of the source. And what I think the distinction might be would be between perceptions of the validity of the source and the, the true state of the world. Um, and it might be the case, Michael, that in future research, if you had people projecting the outcome of the election versus expressing views on the validity of a given poll, you might it might it would be interesting to see if you got the same kind of pattern of results that we did. From an audience member, did you observe heterogeneous fact-checking treatment effects uh, within the sample? For example, was the fact-checking more persistent for some folks, perhaps systematically, even though the average seemed to uh, revert? I, I'm sorry, I can't read the end of the sentence, whether it's reverse or revert. Do you mind muting it, Michael? There we go. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So this research is so fresh that I can only answer that question in part, but let me describe to you the findings that we have. It's an important one. Um, so uh, the research that we've done, um, we looked, we have a, it, the analysis of the COVID experiment I described to you is pre-registered and our pre-registered heterogeneous treatment effect analysis um, uh, looks at a series of factors that we might thought might affect people's vulnerability to false information and receptiveness to fact checks, but that's kind of posed as a series of research questions. So things like um, uh, uh, trust in 
um, health institutions, um, approval of the, lead, the chief executive in a given country, conspiracy predispositions, and actually prior misperceptions themselves, um, which we're able to measure in this pre-treatment wave. And we look uh, systematically using a, a, a measurement, a heterogeneous treatment effect uh, estimation technique called Bayesian causal forest to estimate um, to what extent the effects vary by those factors. What we find interestingly and encouragingly, which I didn't have time to share with you earlier, is that in the, in the wave in question, um, the effects were larger, not smaller, with the folks who were most vulnerable to the misinformation in question. So the effects were larger among people who had higher levels of prior misinformation. The effects were larger um, on people who um, had these attitudinal predispositions that might make them more vulnerable, like um, approval of President Trump here in the US, um, uh, high, you know, lower trust in health institutions and so forth. Um, and I think that's a kind of interesting provocative finding. It suggests um, that uh, these, you know, the hope for fact checks might be greater than we think and that people might actually be uh, willing to uh, revise their views. Um, those folks in particular, if you want to think about it in a, in a pretty uh, simple framework, just have more room to, uh, to move, right? So they have higher levels of misperception. So they kind of have farther that they can go down. Um, I don't believe, however, that we have evidence that those effects were more persistent with those groups. Now that would, I think, be an exploratory analysis under our pre-registration. I don't believe we indicated we would look at heterogeneous treatment effects um, persisting, but I have to double check that. But my recollection is that we either haven't examined that or we find no evidence uh, for it. Um, which is a, a, a discouraging finding. It would be great if we could say at least some groups um, showed evidence of, of persistence. And I'll, um, I'll double check that with my co-authors. And if, if this is of interest to you, anonymous attendee, please feel free to follow up with me. I'd be happy to share that result. How about uh, a question about, did you find that any of YouTube's largest channels were uh, alternative or extremist? I guess what Michael, the interference is pretty bad if you can turn off. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and, and read the question if that's all right. Um, so uh, the next question is uh, Catherine Moez, did you find that any of YouTube's largest channels were flagged as alternative or extremist? So we didn't analyze that formally in the sense of looking at um, where the channels that we identified ranked in the overall distribution of um, YouTube channels, that actually would be interesting to do. Um, but some of the uh, channels that fall particularly into the alternative category are quite large. Um, so Joe Rowe and uh, Steven Crowder are two examples that fall into that area, I believe. Um, so, uh, you know, all, the alternative space is the one where the audiences are the largest. And that has been uh, a, a common concern that's been expressed about um, uh, you know, for instance, Rogan's show, that even though he has many mainstream guests, um, he also has fringe guests who, by virtue of being on a show, which has a huge audience, they reach millions of people. Um, uh, I, hope, I hope that answered your, your, your question, uh, Catherine. Um, the report that we issued on our preliminary findings um, also lists a number of the channels that had been taken down by YouTube um, in the time uh, that our study was conducted. And we find that um, I believe fewer than 100 of the more than 600 alternative and extremist channels on our list were, were, had been taken down. So uh, the vast majority uh, remained, up, remained up as of January of this year, and I would expect uh, are still up now. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to um, uh, Michael Martinez's uh, question, um, which asks about the scaling of the pulse uh, data. Um, and, uh, and I'll also ask if others have questions, I guess, because we're not able to jump in live that in, uh, in, we're, we're, unless you want me freestyling uh, <laughs> um, at, at length, uh, please ask more questions. So Michael asked if the pulse data scale non political sites. So he says, for example, if 65% of those who visit the Walmart website for shopping are self identified conservatives, would that affect the distribution of conservative site visits that you showed? 
Um, so the answer is no, the, um, the, but let me explain a little more about how that works. The scaling that we're using uh, relies on um, uh, these, these data that are referred to uh, from the Bakshi et al. article in Science on um, uh, selective exposure and uh, cons information consumption on Facebook. Um, the scaling was of the top 500 uh, websites uh, focused on hard news topics. Um, so um, the term hard news can be a bit confusing here. This doesn't mean that there was a kind of filter for how carefully the news um, was uh, collected according to journalistic standards. Um, instead, they, they basically built a classifier for the kinds of topics that hard news sites cover, things about government and public policy and so forth, and use that to determine which uh, websites to the set um, in that 500 um, that, are, um, that are the basis for these uh, scalings of people's information diets. Um, they're all websites that have been classified as, um, as focusing on, on hard news uh, topics. There are some edge cases that are worth bearing in mind. And if you look at um, Andy's AJPS article, he gets into the issue of um, uh, the old portals. So it, it turns out that lots of people still have their homepage set to AOL.com and Yahoo.com. And they accordingly have often wire copy news on the front page that lots of people are being exposed to, even though those sites have other kinds of functions and features as well. But it wouldn't cover a website like Walmart. All right, Michael, I don't know if you want to brave coming back on. Should we? I'm going to try. Um, we have a few more minutes uh, that we can take additional questions uh, for Brendan. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, I, I, I at least can't hear you, Michael. I can hear you, Michael. OK. Uh, otherwise, I, I want to thank Brendan for his presentation. Uh, very interesting and stimulating, uh, with a lot of references to uh, very current literature uh, based on studies that Brendan uh, has conducted and continues to be involved in data collection for. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Brendan, uh, for being with us this evening and for your presentation. And thank you to the uh, audience members.